Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for the bonus round, round three of answering your questions. <laughs> Did I saw Tim do something then? Uh, yeah, I mean, what else is there to say? We've done part one, part two. Uh, if you didn't, if you missed those, go check them out because you guys asked a lot of really interesting, sort of different questions this month. So not sure what caused that, but it's made yeah, it um, good. quite interesting. Yeah, a lot of different things. I suppose the last few, it's like. Is FSR better than DLSS? Sort of over and <laughs> over and over again. So, yeah, it's good to get away from those questions and, yeah, discuss some other things. Though we do appreciate all that that um, that um chat as well. But anyway, probably enough waffle from me. Time to get into answering your questions. But, of course, before we do that, today's video sponsor is Thermal Grizzly and their Cryonaut Extreme, which is now available in a 2-gram syringe. This high-performance thermal paste delivers maximum thermal conductivity thanks to an extremely small particle size and layer thickness. It's also very flexible, capable of standing up to sub-zero temperatures for extreme overclocking, but also performs exceptionally well for air and water cooling applications. So if your CPU or GPU needs repasting, then I suggest checking out the Thermal Grizzly range. Link is in the video description. Okay, I'm going to turn to my monitor here because I've got my monitor instead of my phone. Nice big monitor to read off, which is nice. So the first one is, given the current shortage of materials, is there any cause for concern that GPUs released during said shortage would be using subpar parts? Uh, is a situation similar to the bait and switch with SSD components something to look out for? So we're going to see some some graphics cards with, I don't know, what what would they downgrade? The the power stages maybe? Not that they advertise power stages. I guess that's where it differs a bit from SSDs. Um, with SSDs, you get certain, you know, DRAM and, and certain NAND flash and, and controls and all that sort of stuff. And generally that stuff is advertised, at least some of the components. So you expect to get that. Um, and the, the, the specifications are subject to change is a bit dicey. Generally with GPUs, you know, you get the GPU you pay for, you get the memory that runs at the memory spec. Uh, we've seen situations where there might be Micron or Samsung memory, and that's not really advertised. I think that was with the, was it the 5700 XT? I can't remember now, but we've seen that before. So yeah, they might use subpar components, but I think generally it's usually fixed well, it, it's, I suppose it's not. It depends on what power stage is available. Like if Alpha and Amiga are running short and then, you know, on semi or someone else can offer them, they might use those. And that's not necessarily say they're substandard. They might even be better. So anything to add to that, Tim? Now, I think with GPUs as opposed more to storage, you know, NVIDIA and AMD have pretty strict requirements for the GPUs themselves. <laughs> so... You know, they might say, we're going to certify this specific type of That's GDDR true. memory to work with our GPUs. Now, you can choose Micron or Samsung, but only from, let's say, a certain sub-series of that memory. And if there were alternate you know, manufacturing options, they might not actually work at all. At least they wouldn't be certified. In which case, the board partners, I think, would be pretty unlikely to use non-certified components. I think it's similar mm. with some of the power stages and stuff. Obviously... You know, they're going to need to meet a minimum requirement for the power delivery system into the GPU or it's not yep. going to work. And yeah, maybe they could choose significantly over the minimum spec or closer to the minimum spec. But at the end of the day, the GPU is still going to work because it's a, you know, a range of different components going into it. With something like an SSD, usually it's the company themselves choosing to put together the whole product. So they're not basing it around a certain you know, product, they're saying, oh, okay, we want to build this specific G uh, SSD to these specs and we're going to, you know, we're going to contract out our memory to Micron for that. And then we're going to purchase the DDR, you know, cache for, from some other brand and put them all together. And then they can do those sorts of bait and switches. But for the GPUs mm -hmm. being sort of that partnership between AMD, NVIDIA and the AIBs, I think it's much harder for them to do something like that. So I wouldn't be super concerned with this in even in this current yeah. GPU shortage. Yeah, that's an excellent point to bring up. And that was a point that came up a lot when we did the whole DDR4 version of the GT1030 and we really directly attacked NVIDIA over that. Yep. I thought that was anti-consumer anti and all that sort of stuff. And we had a lot of people push back and say, you know, why are you having a go at NVIDIA? Really, this is on the AIB that is making the DDR4 version. It's like, well, <laughs> that's not really how it works. Yep. So the AIBs can't just say, oh, we're going to pick a certain GPU and we're going to use really cheap memory that we have in abundance and that'll help us 
sort of piggyback on the reputation of that part. NVIDIA certainly will not allow that to happen. So yeah, as Tim said, there is a specification that they have to adhere to, and there might be multiple specifications, but they can't go you know, with something even worse than that. And they, they, they probably can't even go in between. It's one or the other. Yep. Next question. With 1440p high refresh becoming more mainstream, most games are GPU limited. So therefore, what do you think is the oldest CPU you could run without running into a significant performance loss. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I would probably say you'd need beyond a quad core or around the sort of quad good quality four core eight thread processor. Is that I'm sort of on the right track, not being as much of a yes. CPU expert? Uh, well, yeah, when you answer these questions, as I've sort of explained before, by sort of saying well, yeah, quad core is not going to do it. You're then really emphasizing the need for a certain amount of cores, which is true, but it's, again, as I said, it's more about CPU power. So if we had a quad core, like a Zen 3 quad core with a, a 32 or even a 64 megabyte L3 cache, that obviously it would be 32 megabytes. Uh, but if you had a real fat quad core, you know, it clocked high, really wide cores, then that would that would play all the latest and greatest games, I suspect, just fine. But that's not the case with quad cores. They have very small L3 cache. They're, they're not the big, fat, wide cores. So it's, yeah, cores ain't cores, basically, is what it boils, boils down to. You would be wanting sort of the, the level of overall CPU performance you get from something like, I don't know, uh, like a, a Ryzen 7 3700X class CPU, which is like a... For, for general usage, that's sort of a Ryzen 5 5600X, but then it gets a bit more complicated than that because the Ryzen 5 5600X has significantly improved DRAM latency and even quarter core communication, which makes it much better for gaming than a 3700X, despite the fact that when you run like Cinebench, which isn't a memory sensitive workload, they're similar in terms of performance. So it is hard to sort of give a general answer. You've really got to look at, I guess, CPUs in, in gaming performance, but obviously, Something like a 5600X, uh, even maybe the 10600K, which is a bit slower. 10600K is probably sort of as slow as I'd recommend going there. But Yeah. yeah. I think it's important with, with 1440p as well to not forget that with the highest-end GPUs, you can see some games where you're largely CPU limited, or at least where it's not like every CPU delivers the exact same performance anymore and there are we do start to see some separation between your sort of your mid-range and your highest end CPUs by you know might be a couple of percent here or there but that means that if you you know you are you are buying let's say a Ryzen 5 1600 hoping that that's going to be good for 1440p high refresh gaming in the future as you upgrade your GPU that's going to become less and less sufficient even at that resolution so i i think to to answer the question in the simplest way possible, you know, what is the oldest CPU you can run without running into significant performance losses? Because it's, it's really about what can drive the high refresh rate gaming experience. And I think it is something like a sort of a, a 10th generation six core 12 thread CPU. So yep. you know, the core yeah, i5, 10400, that, that sort of CPU is, you wouldn't want to go slower than that. Uh, and then, yeah, but I, again, it comes down to, so that, that sort of answers that question. But then when it comes to what should I get What's the best pairing? It's really budget. So if you're looking for 1440p high refresh rate gaming sort of on the the tightest budget possible, I'd certainly recommend a Core i5-10400F because they're like $170 US right now. And then whatever GPU allows for that, like, you know, an RTX 3060 Ti maybe off the top of my head, I'd have to look at the data. But yeah, again, the 1440p thing is even difficult because it's like, is it competitive 1440p exactly. high refresh rate gaming? Yeah. Or is it like cyberpunk with you know the highest quality settings so there's there's it's just not a simple uh one to answer and there's no one there's no one answer that sort of addresses that okay we've got long time patreon member names here with his first q a question coming in so good job we love names with the rumors of next gen performance improvements crazy pricing and presumably high power draw i feel like they are more so pushing high-end products to fill the void left over by SLI slash Crossfire while the rest of the product stack gets pushed up with it. So he's got an example here. R9290X slash 780Ti buyer would now buy a 7600XT or 7700XT while the R9295X2 slash 780Ti SLI buyer 
would still go for the top end 7900 XT. So obviously those are for you know, this next generation that's coming up. Do you think this is a fair assessment or is it just a way to better cope with ever increasing prices and power draw? Now, with this question, this is kind of the first time I've really thought about this in any significant way because when you think about it, we have gone through this situation where back in that generation of the, the 295X2 and 780s and all that, people were frequently using SLI as their top-end GPU setup. So you'd buy two of those mm -hmm. GPUs, your power consumption would easily be in the 500 watt range for your two GPUs, you need you know, good power supply. And then over time, SLI and Crossfire have been killed off. We're, and today, mm -hmm. we're sort of sitting in a position where power consumption appears to be creeping back up. So in a way, if the next generation GPUs were running at like 500 watts or 450 watts or whatever, that would be quite yeah, similar yeah. to those SLI and Crossfire setups of, of old with pricing that, again, would be, you know, two $700 GPUs is a, around what a 3090 costs these days. If the next generation card is similar or slightly more expensive, you're sort of talking about that. I think it's a really interesting way to, to, to think about it. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, obviously, yeah, with those higher end products, the, the margins were higher and whether it was two GPUs on the one card or selling two, you know, like 70, 80, uh, 780 TIs, for example, you know, you, you, instead of selling a, a high end customer, one of those, you've now got the opportunity to sell them two and make twice the profit. So yeah, that all makes sense. I think it's also what I said in a tweet after the RTX 3080 was released is the fact that gaming has now really become a mainstream thing. You, you think back, especially these generations that we're talking about here, uh, while it was slowly becoming more mainstream, it was sort of a niche pastime PC gaming. Like not everyone did. It was sort of, you were considered a bit of a computer nerd for a lack of a better word if you did a lot of computer gaming and bought high-end graphics cards. But yeah, now it's it's more mainstream. And with that, you get more customers, you get uh, a higher, well, not a high percentage, but you end up with in that percentage more people that are willing to spend a lot of money on their graphics card. So yeah, that, well, that's what bumps everyone up. I saw a few people argue like, you know, the RTX 3080, all that seven hundred dollars is still ridiculous because when things become more mainstream and more accessible, generally that lowers prices. And it's like, well, yeah, it can, but also, you know, it's, it's a demand thing as well, we're seeing. So they can yeah. only make so many of these and with more people wanting them, it just, it jacks up the prices. And it, it's, so I think it's inevitable that it was going to get more expensive. Yeah, and it's not, I think what you're saying when you say it becomes more mainstream, it's not more mainstream as in, there's more buyers in a specific class, you know, the class that we mm -hmm. normally refer to as the mainstream class, sort of your mm -hmm. $250 GPUs. It's more, it becomes mainstream in that it captures a much wider audience of people, yeah. which means there's always yeah. going to be people that only have $250 to spend. But as it becomes more mainstream, high roller type people that have your own big salaries and, and good jobs that have thousands upon thousands of dollars to spend on their hobbies and and pcs and that sort of thing you know the sort of people that buy high-end cars or boats or those sort of things when they come into pc gaming they can afford those gpus that are like five percent faster but cost a thousand dollars more and i think that that's sort of the yeah. reality that we're seeing and even today a 3090 is not that much more you know doesn't give you that much more performance than a 3080 but how much more does it cost and so I think a lot of these discussions and what you're talking about, when people look at that and they say, oh, oh no, you know, the high-end GPUs are costing $1,500. It's like, yeah, that, that sucks for a lot of people that would rather only spend $500, but you're getting like 90% of the performance in normal times at the MSRP with the $700 to $800 GPU, which is not nearly as outrageous sounding. And that, I think this question is sort of talking about is, yeah, the next generation of cards might have those two thousand dollar gpus or whatever they end up being but they are filling that premium slot for the you know very rich people that have a lot to spend on hobbies that would have previously bought sli setups because again sli didn't scale very well in some games you got no performance improvement in a lot of games you weren't getting double the performance of those two gpus so again i think that that sort of illustrates where the market's going and really if the 7600 XT and 7700 XT are good products at good prices that give you more performance per dollar than you got last generation, I think most people will be happy even if that that Halo product is ridiculously expensive and uses 
tons of power doesn't really matter for yeah. the for the normal segment of buyers. Do you think AMD or Nvidia for that matter should continue selling the 6000 series slash 30 series at reduced prices after next gen GPUs launch so that we have an option for lower budget graphics cards next generation as this generation has been really bad for getting those good to performance, a good price to performance rather, and prices have also ballooned since Turing. Well, It'd be a nice option to have, wouldn't it? It'd be a nice backup, but I I don't think that would happen. Uh, again, it depends on what process node they move to and, and what supply they have of the process that these parts are currently being manufactured on. And then it's there's a whole lot of other things as well, like are they still using the same you know memory? Are they still using the same GDR6 uh, or 6X memory? And then that won't necessarily make the part much more affordable because why allocate that to a part you're going to sell much cheaper than a new or current generation part you can sell for more. So it gets a bit messy that messy there and they only buy so much wafer allocation as well. So they'd have to renegotiate for the older wafers and yeah. yeah. So it's, it's quite complicated. I think that's the biggest point is the, the wafers, you know, the, all those contracts are uh, set up years in advance. So a company like mm. NVIDIA would typically you know, shift their allocation from old node to new node when they do those node upgrades. And they, they'd only keep a small amount of allocation on those older nodes, which would make this sort of thing impossible. Because basically what this question is asking is for AMD and NVIDIA to respond to the current market when their wafer allocations and agreements have probably been set up well before now um, without this sort of current market condition. So again, it'd be, like you say, it'd be very hard to go back and recontract that. I think if anything, AMD is more likely to have that flexibility just because I would expect them to keep quite a lot of seven nanometer wafer allocation to run CPUs and GPUs off. And that gives them a bit more flexibility because you know maybe CPU sales aren't as strong. They could reallocate you know some of their wafer supply from one thing to the other thing and sort of you know shift more GPUs than CPUs if the market is looking really good for GPUs. But again, I don't think Nvidia has that capability. Memory is obviously an issue as well. Yeah, I think these sort of questions and ideas have come up a lot more recently because obviously the GPU crisis, but because I think we were a bit spoiled, at least on the CPU front with, with Ryzen, uh, with like Zen Plus, for example, being just absolutely dirt cheap yep. when Zen 3 came in uh, and, and, and continued to sell throughout the life of that product because they were on different manufacturing processes and because they don't require things like DRAM, uh, the CPU is a much more simplified package, let's say, when compared to an entire graphics card. And so you were seeing like, you know, what was the, even like a Ryzen 7 2700X, what was that like once $330 US, it was selling for like 130 US. So yep. that's kind of amazing. So people were buying brand new products at sort of less than what you'd probably normally expect to pay on the secondhand market. And yeah, it was kind of, we were kind of spoilt for choice there, I suppose, with CPUs. But yeah, unfortunately, the same thing hasn't quite happened with GPUs. But again, a lot of people would love to go back to the $150 RX 580s at this point in time, although that is a very slow old GPU. You know, being able to buy a GPU for $150 would be uh, kind of nice right now. Yeah, I think it's that balance. Anyway. It's like, what, what, AMD and NVIDIA would have a pretty good idea of what they can do with their next generation of GPUs. And it may even make sense for them to still produce an older GPU, like how AMD produced the RX 580 for so long is because it yeah. was a better, you know, they could get better margins on it. It was a better value card to produce than the new expensive node 5500 XT, which required seven nanometers. It required, you know, the generation newer memory going from GDDR5 to GDDR6, I believe. And so that made the 5500 XT in your review when you said that it wasn't a very good value GPU, it didn't improve price to performance mm -hmm. too much because of those reasons. So potentially for a next gen, they might choose to do this. But again, depends a lot on all sorts of factors that we've just talked about. All right. Average FPS is the most common measurement of gaming performance that I see across YouTube and websites. As someone who upgraded to a 5600X from an i5-4690K, I found that frame time consistency is much more important in gaming than the volume of frames being churned out. What would you, uh, would you look into using frame time graphs in the future? Interesting 
question here. I'm not, I'm not really sure where these sort of misconceptions stem from exactly, but like the Core i5 4690K, that that's not a fast CPU. Like, <laughs> I mean, the average frame rates alone on that thing will not be good. <laughs> uh, it, it's not churning out max FPS by a long shot. That is a very slow CPU by today's standards. The 5600X is almost infinitely faster <laughs> in comparison. It is so much more powerful. It's just not even funny. So I am not surprised that you've noticed an improvement in your gaming performance. As for the average FPS is the most common measurement of gaming performance that I see across YouTube and websites, like we and many others include 1% lows and they are a very accurate and clear indicator of issues resulting in frame time inconsistencies. Like if you're going to see any kind of stuttering, that will certainly show up in the 1% lows and we have a ton of evidence for that. Like if I test your Core i5 4690K, which you can look at, we've got graphs in our day one reviews that include the Core i5 7600K and the frame time consistency for games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as an example, are horrific. The 1% lows are like half that of a part like the 5600X, probably even lower. So you can clearly see where those frame time inconsistencies are within our graphs. So I don't know why a lot of people are like, you know, average FPS, you, you can't, tell about fra it's like yeah guys we have one percent lows like have a look at those they they tell you what you yeah. need to know um, I think as for the the frame time graph sorry tim i'll just, just yeah, go for it. as for the frame time graphs i am not a fan of frame time graphs like for us for science type video having a look at those analyzing those for individual cpus yeah can be maybe interesting no i, I dubious to how valu uh, valuable they are because they're just so difficult to read. Uh, overlaying them with other CPUs just becomes this mess. You can't really tell what's what. And frankly, it's visualized just so much better in a bar graph showing 0.1% yeah. lows, 1% lows. I, I don't know what this insistence is on this being a more technical, more thorough way of showing the data because it just simply isn't. It, it just is just is not, I don't know why uh, some people like to insist that it is. And in a lot of instances, we are playing these games to get you guys the data. Most of the games don't have a built-in benchmark. And in a lot of instances where they do, we don't use the built-in benchmark, such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider, for example. We do not use the built-in benchmark for testing CPUs, period. We use a village section of the game, which is very CPU heavy, heavily, uh, very CPU demanding, much, much more so than the built-in benchmark. So, I mean, yeah, if you watch any of our reviews, you will know the 5600 XT is significantly better than a Haswell-based Core i5 for quite literally every performance metric. So sorry, Tim, yeah. I'll, I could keep going, but I'll let you talk. I think it comes down to people not really understanding. Well, I think some people understand what the 1% low is, but beyond that, mm -hmm. not knowing how to read a bar graph that's got average and 1% lows on it. It's not just mm -hmm. about measuring 1% lows from one CPU versus another CPU. It's about the difference between the 1% low and the average frame rate for the same processor. If you've got a- Relative to rel other parts. Yeah, so Sorry. if you've got a mm -hmm. CPU where the 1% the low is very close to the average, that means that on mm -hmm. average, you're getting a good frame rate and 99% of the time, your frame rate is gonna be above the 1% low. So if those two numbers are close, you're getting very consistent performance because the average and mm -hmm. the 99th percentile are basically the same. Then if you've got another CPU where you've got an average that's quite high, but a 1% low that's quite low, then the difference between that average and the sort of minimum-ish performance that you're getting is large. So there's less consistency, and that is showing you exactly what you're saying in this question about frame time consistency. If those two numbers are far apart, frame time consistency is worse and that always shows itself in these graphs. And again, if you show 0.1% lows, which we don't usually do because it doesn't really show much more than the 1% lows do, but with those two metrics, you can perfectly see in those charts when you've got you know, close average and 1%, close average of 1% for two CPUs, then another CPU where the 1% lows a lot lower, that CPU is gonna have frame time stuttering. It's gonna have inconsistent performance. Mm -hmm. And you can see that from the bar chart that you don't need to look at the frame time graph to get that information. So I think that le learning about the 1% lows in that way, learning how to read these charts is quite important. And I think a lot of people that 
you know, are asking for things like frame time graphs don't necessarily understand that, which again, you know, it's not immediately obvious on first glance. It's, it's much more obvious when you see a frame time graph and you can see that big spike and you can say, oh, that part studded. Whereas this is mm -hmm. just a different interpretation of that data. The other issue that I have with um, frame time graphs, now I'll cut you off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, continue, continue, Tim. <laughs> the other issue I have with frame time graphs that you didn't mention was that mm -hmm. they are not an average of runs. So when you see... No, I was about to say that, yeah, yeah. When you, when you see a frame time graph, it's one run. So if you're comparing mm -hmm. one GPU to another GPU using frame time graphs, you don't know if those stutters that you're seeing, you know, those big spikes, whether that was just due to that run that was captured or whether that's true for all runs. Whereas when you average mm -hmm. together all the data and you average your 1% lows, it's still capturing any necessary spikes, but it's also doing that across multiple runs, which gives you more robust and accurate data, which is why personally... Yes. I don't like showing the frame time graphs. I think they're hard to read for, for a start. If you've got two graphs that are yeah. like this and you've got another CPU that's like doing that just above it, very hard to read and see the margins. But I also don't like when they've when you show footage, you know, one one GPU running the game here on the left side and another GPU running another game on the other side because again, you've run into the same issue. It's not a it's a one run average of that game. Yes. So again, you, you yep. run to the same issues as showing frame time graphs. I know people prefer that sort of method where you see the FPS counter from one side and the FPS counter on the other side. But if the footage isn't lining up perfectly, if you're just doing a one run average, it, it doesn't give you that robust information that three run averages in bar charts do, which is why we tend to show them. Of course, th those other techniques can have their place from time to time and you know, it's a nice visual representation mm -hmm. at times and could be mm -hmm. useful, but I don't think it's as useful and as immediately visually representing the data as the bar charts do. But again, we're bar chart fans, so we're gonna we're gonna defend the bar charts to, till we die, basically. Well, not yeah, I mean <laughs> I, I know you're just somewhat joking about that because look, if we we we're going for what is the most accurate way of testing, like doesn't matter how difficult it is. We want to provide you guys with the most accurate information possible in the most easy to digest method possible. So if simply recording gameplay footage, which we do a lot of the time anyway, and showing that to you guys was the best way of achieving those goals, we would certainly do that. But as Tim talked about, there are a lot of shortcomings with that test method, uh, mainly one of them being that there is no way of showing an average of three runs unless you show here's pass one, here's pass two, here's pass three, and here's the average of those results, which is you might as well just show a bar graph at that point. And that is not uh, an efficient way of conveying the information that you guys require. So we respect your time and we try to do all that background work so then you can watch the videos, get all the information you need in whatever it is, 15 minutes or whatever, and move on. But yeah, people who say that, you know, you should show gameplay because, you know, showing the, the, the frame pacing and all that is the best way to, it's just rubbish. It's not true. The best way is to benchmark a certain scene, 60 uh, seconds or whatever it is, find a demanding scene, test that three times and provide the average result because it can be so misleading doing one test pass. You know, what caused that frame stutter? Was it Steam decided to check for an update or any number of things, Windows doing something, exactly a virus right. scanner doing something. There's so many things that can cause that. And yeah, and again, you could say that, oh, but that, that stutter is constantly caused on a six core processor where it won't be seen on a 16 core processor. Maybe that's true. But again, that will be reflected to a degree in something like a 1% low. Hmm. But also I think there's too much emphasis on this whole like getting really anal about the whole, oh, did it spike there? Was that a spike? Because if you're buying a high-end gaming PC, you're spending $500 plus on your CPU, you're spending $1,000 on your GPU, you're buying you know $400 worth of memory, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, I think you could justify being that sort of you know, on it with, you know, you, you want it to be as smooth as possible and no frame stuttering. And honestly, if you're buying a really high end rig, you should be achieving that anyway. But if we're talking about like a Core i5 10400F versus a Ryzen 7 5800X, and you're like, oh, oh, see that one stutter there? See the, the Core i5 does that one stutter? I don't care that it's like three times cheaper. It did that one stutter that you're probably not going to notice. So therefore, get eight cores, you must have it. It's just, it's, 
I don't know, it just misses the point. Like, if someone's getting something that's significantly cheaper and it may not be absolutely flawless, that's okay. It's kind of like what we talked about earlier with the 5700 XT. It wasn't their most well-polished and flawless product, at least upon release, but it offered you a great level of performance for a great price, so people were willing to sort of take the punt on it. And yeah, I think this emphasis on being just ridiculous about frame pacing misses the point in a lot of mm. you know, scenarios. Yeah, so. and really I think the most important thing is that when you see a frame chart, you don't there's you don't know, as you were saying, what is causing any of the issues that you're seeing in those charts. There's no mm. there's literally no way of knowing. So a lot of people interpret those spikes as being caused by the game. But as you said, it could be yep. a background process. And th- there's literally no way of knowing. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter that, you know, you might assume that it's one thing or the other. If if your assumption is wrong, then you're not getting accurate data, which is why it's very important to sort of do those three run averages and show it as an average because it removes those, um, it removes the guesswork that you need to do with those charts. Even if you see two lines of you know frames going like that, and another one might dip down a bit. You don't know, for example, that the the footage at those two exact moments wasn't lining up. It could be mm-hmm. that one CPU is providing better performance than the other, or it could be that when you're benchmarking the game, that you know the footage shown in those exact moments was was different on the two processes. Especially if you're not using a built-in benchmark, there's there's just no way of knowing. Um, which again is why averaging the data together is more important, and I think why you see the majority of the work that we do, and you know most review sites, you know Gamers Nexus and Antec use very similar methods. It's because it genuinely is one of the best ways of showing this sort of um, performance. And again, mm-hmm. the introduction of 1% lows is pioneered by good old Scott Wasson over at uh, Tech Report back in the day when he was doing a lot of this frame time work has really helped simplify that and mean that we don't need to rely on frame time graphs anymore. The 1% low does a great mm-hmm. job. 99th percentile, obviously, which is the same thing, shows you a great a great amount of data that is, is very helpful and simplifies it for you. Yep. But I think, uh, again, you were joking about it, but we aren't married to a certain method. So if another method came up tomorrow that was proven to be the best and we investigate it, it's like, yeah, look, this is a better way of accurately showing the user experience, we'd change like that. Like, yep. it's not a problem for us at all. You guys are going to, if we stop doing bar graphs and do another method and we make accurate recommendations that you guys uh, believe were accurate, then you guys are going to tune in. And that's the thing, like, a lot of the CPU recommendations and stuff we've made where we've seen, you know, parts stuttering and we've said this part stutters there, you guys have reported back. And I'm I'm not talking about a couple of people, anecdotal evidence from a few people. We're talking about thousands of people have been like, yeah, no, this CPU is no good in this game. And then when we've said this CPU is perfectly acceptable, oh, thousands of you have reported back that, yeah, look, this works really well. So it's not like our recommendations or what we're seeing differs from the community at large. And, you know, we run a lot of polls on stuff like that. We're constantly getting your feedback uh, to find out if the test methods we're using and that stuff is accurately refre- reflecting what you guys are finding in your gaming experience. I'm looking for a new monitor and are now balancing between an IPS LG 32 GP850 versus a VA Samsung Odyssey G7. I'm leaning towards the latter, but I'm afraid I'm missing out on something with the IPS tech. But for the life of me, I can't see what it would be except viewing angles, which I don't mind. I'm mostly gaming first-person shooters, not always competitive, and the price difference is 60 US dollars in the G7's favor. Is there something about the IPS that I would miss out on when going with the highest-end VA? Well, luckily these days, I kind of see where this question is coming from because in the high end, it's a very different situation between these technologies than at the lower end. At the high end, Samsung has done a really great job with their VA technology in Odyssey G7, which means that, yeah, you're really not missing out on a lot. It's got a great performance. It's going to give you decent color quality. It's got the really high refresh rate, and obviously the 1440p combination is great for gaming. So, you know, the, you're looking at two very similar things, and if you wanted that better contrast ratio, then, yeah, the VA is going to give you what the IPS doesn't. Um, you know, you might swing to the IPS because it's flat. That, that may be one reason. But we're talking about two very... I guess the point is we're talking about two very similar products in the high end. And there's certainly no reason not to go with the VA or not think that it's as good as an IPS in that range. The issue that we get is more in the mid-range where IPS is significantly better than VA because you see 
things like dark level smearing, which gives you that unsightly sort of black dark trails behind things when they're moving. And that clearly doesn't look as good as an IPS and IPS has come down in price a lot. So the battle is very different there. And I think that's where, you know, you might've seen my video talking about, you know, are cheap VAs still worth buying? And it really does depend on what's available there. Whereas in the high end, VAs are, are quite, quite a good technology. So hopefully we see the VA tech come down from the high end to the mid range so that there's more of a battle there. But certainly for now in the mid range, yeah, IPS is the way to go. And then at the high end, doesn't really matter too much. Just buy whatever product suits the suits the things that you need. There's certainly no major flaws like we see in other categories. So I think that I think that probably answers that question for you. At least hopefully it does. Yeah, maybe. I think there's something you have overlooked in the monitor discussion here, though, Tim. Like, say you know you buy the Samsung Odyssey G7, and a mate comes over and he's like, "Wow, this is a really nice panel. You know, what is it?" And you're like, "Oh, it's, it's a G7." Whereas if alternatively you would have had to say it's the 32 GP 850, like it's just you wouldn't be able you know, to remember. About that. How many yeah. times? How many times do you want to have to say that to your mates? Like it's G7, so Easy. I'd get the Samsung for that reason alone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Do you think it would be better for AMD to just adjust pricing of their Zen 3 parts downwards? Sounds pretty good. <laughs> for example, the 5600X towards $200, and when the time is right, or would you prefer they just released new SKUs to slot in to the lower price points? Um, I'd love them to discount the Zen 3 parts personally, so I think that would be the most preferable option, uh, but they're not going to do that, are they? So, I mean, is it what I, what I think I would like to have happen or what AMD is going to realistically do? Um, because they're two very different answers. But at this point in time, I don't see AMD adjusting the price of Zen 3 downwards. Uh, from everything I've heard, they're selling incredibly well. They're outselling Intel in terms of new desktop CPUs. So they're not going to cut their margins for no reason. They've also still got the seven nanometer supply constraints because, well, there's not Radeon GPUs galore. So there's absolutely no point uh, and no reason to, to discount Zen 3. So it will remain as is. As for the new SKUs being priced more competitively, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Yep, absolutely. Okay, unfortunately, I've got some pretty terrible news. That is the end of the August Q&A series, part three, done and dusted. We've answered all the questions that we could possibly fit into this series for this month. And uh, you'll have to wait till next month, the end of next month, to uh, to ask a question if it didn't make it in this one. Sad so make times. it a good one. <laughs> yeah. So not a lot of fun, though. It was a good one, wasn't it, Tim? Yeah, absolutely. Really enjoyed the questions, as we sort of said at the start of this episode. Lots of really interesting mm. ones this month. So good job, you guys, for answering questions. And I'm going to put a little sneaky plug in here for the Hub Clips channel, um, which we've sort of been mm -hmm. building over time. I thought, you know, we haven't mentioned in this Q&A series yet, but basically Hub Clips channel Go subscribe there. We sort of split up our Q&A episodes into the most interesting questions. Just each video answers one question. Very simple if you prefer that sort of format for this. Rather than watching the 30-minute episode, you can get like yeah five-minute videos instead on the things that you're interested in. So we'll put a link somewhere for Hub Clips. It's sort of been simmering away in the background, but I guess we should probably mention it every once in a while in these videos. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a good way of, I think, archiving the more interesting questions as well, because a few times I've wanted to go back and so many times, well, more than a few, really, so many times I've wanted to go back and find a question that we answered a year or two years ago, and I just, you just can't find them. Like the search feature isn't powerful enough where you can find questions within videos, uh, yep. especially when we weren't doing the video index stuff. But yep. anyway, the fact that you can sort of type in the question and it brings up the video uh, is really cool, or at least the clip from that Q&A series. So, yeah, very cool. And if you're interested, yeah, you can go back and sort of browse through all of those. Yep. You obviously got Float Plane and Patreon and all that stuff as well, but you always all know the drill about that stuff. 20% club at this point anyway. So, yeah, we're all good on that. And I guess that's pretty much it for our Q&A series for August of 2021. I'm your host, Tim. I'm your host, Dave. We'll see you in the next see one. See you next time.